Stoicism has the capacity to profoundly transform the way we live and face our lives. The Stoics pioneered the understanding of human emotions, teaching us how to develop emotional intelligence and strengthen our inner resilience, increasing our ability to face life's challenges with calm, clarity and wisdom. Their words have stood the test of time, and now I will share 12 lessons inspired by the works of history's most eminent philosophers, Epictetus, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. Their timeless lessons can light the way to a more meaningful and fulfilling life. Before we continue with this valuable knowledge, don't forget to leave your like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on any teachings. After all, they can transform your life. Part 1. Epictetus Epictetus of all the Stoics had a very different life. He was born a slave and died one of the most influential masters of his time. However, he never considered himself a master. He was a Stoic philosopher, someone in search of a very specific kind of knowledge. Practical knowledge that, when applied, helps us to face and overcome life's inevitable difficulties. Through his own life experiences and the wisdom of his great mentor, the Stoic philosopher Musonius Rufo, Epictetus acquired the kind of knowledge for which people would travel hundreds of kilometers just to listen to him, even if it was only for an hour or two. Parents sent their children to learn from him, regardless of their social status, and even Emperor Hadrian competed for the opportunity to sit at Epictetus' feet. Fortunately, there was a young man who regularly listened to Epictetus and made an effort to record everything he had to say. Remarkably, these notes have survived to the present day and have been passed on to some of history's greatest figures over the past millennia. Even the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius expressed his gratitude to whoever lent him a copy of Epictetus's works in his diary. We know that Theodore Roosevelt, one of the notable American presidents, carried a copy of Epictetus with him during his expedition to the River of Doubt, an incredibly dangerous journey. Admiral James Stockdale carried the lessons of Epictetus with him while leading fighter squadrons in combat in Vietnam and applied them to survive for seven years as a prisoner of war. The Admiral said he would not surrender as a prisoner, just as Epictetus did not surrender as a slave. The list is endless, and after following this video, you will understand why you would add Epictetus' name to the list of your mentors, for he was truly one of the wisest and most inspiring people to have ever existed in human history. First Stoic Lesson – Dichotomy of Control Separate and distinguish things into two categories – the external things over which we have no control and the choices we make regarding what we can control. Where do we find good and evil within ourselves? Only in our choices. This one skill, as Epictetus claimed, will transform your life. The art of discerning between what is within our reach and what is not. For example, if a flight is delayed due to the weather, there's no point in shouting at an airline employee or making a fuss because the storm won't go away because of it. No amount of wishing will make you taller, shorter, or born in another country, no matter how hard you try. Some people just won't like you. What's more, the time we spend fighting against these unalterable realities is wasted time that we could devote to things that are within our control. As Epictetus said, the only thing we control is how we react to things that happen and the decisions we make as a result, and the same goes for you. Focus on clearly identifying which parts of your day are under your control and which are not. Not only will this bring you more happiness, but it will also put you at an advantage over those who don't realize they're wasting time on battles they can't win. Your mind will be lighter, because you won't end up occupying it with dozens of unnecessary things. Test this mentality, and you'll see how much lighter your life will be. Second Stoic Lesson – You Decide How to React Epictetus claimed that it's not events that upset people, but the judgment we make of them. Albert Ellis, one of the most influential figures in modern psychology, used this idea as the basis for the development of cognitive behavioral therapy. Epictetus claimed that this is the most important power we possess. Something happens, but it's up to us to decide whether it's unfair, bad, or a failure. Someone says something, but it's up to us to decide whether it's offensive, arrogant, or allows someone to anger us. Epictetus advised realizing that your mind is agreeing with the provocation. Events are objective. Their interpretation as offensive is merely your opinion, and you always have the power to change it. To make Epictetus' point a little easier, consider the following. It's not an event and a reaction. 
but rather an event, a judgment or observation about that event, and only then a reaction to it. Focus on seeing what your judgment is. Third Stoic lesson, maintain humility. Abandon pride and vanity as Epictetus instructed. It's impossible to learn when you believe you already know everything. Epictetus always kept his eyes and ears open, actively looking for opportunities to learn from all people and situations. This attitude should accompany us on a daily basis, whether you are an expert in your field or a beginner. Every person we meet, every situation we get involved in, every book we read or movie we watch, represents a chance for learning, self-development and progress. This was one of Epictetus's favorite questions. Have you progressed beyond everything? Our answer should focus on what we don't know, on what we can improve rather than praising ourselves for being masters. This lesson can be practiced in places where you know you are the person with the least understanding of the subject. In this way, you will exercise the humility to absorb what is said and improve in that area. My question to you is, can you exercise this humility? Fourth Stoic Lesson Turn difficulties into opportunities. Epictetus claimed that true character is revealed in difficult times. Therefore, when problems arise, think of yourself as a fighter facing a challenging opponent with the aim of becoming the best version of yourself. Difficulties can be interpreted in different ways, as failures, injustices, or insurmountable obstacles. But it's up to you to train your mind to look at these challenges in a more positive light, as opportunities to learn about resistance, patience, resilience, and overcoming, or as opportunities to demonstrate your worth by strengthening your determination. Epictetus preferred the latter perspective and became, both in his time and ours, the ultimate symbol of the human capacity to overcome adverse circumstances. He said that it wasn't about passively accepting difficulties, but rather choosing to work with them, making the most of them, and seeing them as opportunities, not obstacles. In this way, we can turn everything that happens to us into fuel for growth. We can become better and stronger in the face of challenges. You will truly understand this, according to Epictetus, when you realize that there is no point in breaking what is unbreakable. You can lose something, like a glass, but by wanting to break it, it is you who suffers. Don't expect the puzzle of your life to be solved in a single day. Things take time to happen. Instead, find satisfaction in putting it together and keep moving forward, eager to find the next piece that fits. As Epictetus said, you are a free person and no one can harm you or stop you from doing what is right. Epictetus believed that the power of choice was the supreme ability of the human being and that by distinguishing what is under our control from what is not, we can achieve inner peace and wisdom. In addition, he emphasized the importance of not being controlled by our judgments about events, but rather keeping an open mind and learning from all experiences. It wasn't just Epictetus who thought this way. Marcus Aurelius said, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. In other words, changing direction is not what needs to be done, but rather seeing how to overcome this obstacle. Fifth Stoic lesson, stay in reality. Seneca said, nothing will ever please me, however excellent or beneficial it may be, if I must withhold its knowledge myself. Nothing good is pleasant to possess without friends who share it. Our eyes can be frightened by many more things than those that can crush us. We often suffer more in our imagination than in reality. Seneca's life was marked by countless adversities. He was born with a chronic lung disease and lived during the reigns of the first five emperors, who became progressively more disturbed and violent compared to their predecessors. Seneca was exiled and lost everything on two occasions. Despite all this suffering, his advice was that the only thing that should worry us is what really worries us. He emphasized that we spend so much time imagining and worrying about the future that we torture ourselves more than what actually worries us. Seneca stressed that pain and suffering are inevitable, but that we should avoid phantom premonitions of what may or may not happen. Instead of suffering in anticipation, we should focus our minds on the present. Seneca said that we should stay in reality. His famous quote reminds us of this. We suffer more in our imagination more often than in reality. Sixth Stoic Lesson. Develop Mental Resistance. Seneca asserted, Excellence declines without an adversary. Just as fire is the test of gold, adversity is the test of strong men. We like to live comfortably, to minimize inconveniences, to not force ourselves to do what we don't like, to find what we like where we like it and never leave it. However, Seneca warned, 
that this approach is a death trap. A person who is never challenged and always gets what they want leads a tragic life. He said, the body should be treated more rigorously so that it may not be disobedient to the mind. Consider your own life for a moment. What kind of difficulties do you put yourself through on a daily basis? Imagine yourself as a karate fighter and on your first day fighting, you get kicked in the ribs. It's going to hurt a lot. But after 10 years of being a karate fighter, you won't be defeated by a kick. You'll be able to face countless rounds of punches and kicks and come back the next day to train again. It's not that the blow has lost its force. Your opponents have become stronger. The change has taken place in your body and your mind. You've developed resilience over time. Your tolerance for suffering, both physical and mental, has increased because your mind has learned that you can withstand much more than a kick. And if you continue to challenge yourself to move forward in the face of difficulties, you will reap the rewards. That's why Seneca said, you have gone through life without adversaries. No one can know what you are capable of, not even you. He emphasized the importance of adversity, not only in accepting the challenges that life presents us with, but also in actively seeking out difficulties in order to become stronger, better, and more prepared. He said that every day we should challenge ourselves, make decisions that push us forward instead of settling. When we face something difficult, we should be grateful for the opportunity to develop our potential. Despite not being a Stoic philosopher, Socrates had a great influence on the creation of this philosophy. And for this, he has a very powerful phrase. Socrates said, It is a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty and strength of which his body is capable. This doesn't just mean physically, but also the intellectual potential we can reach if we embrace difficulties and develop mental toughness. Nowadays, we have lost this ability due to the comfort of the modern world, which has weakened our ability to face problems and strengthen our minds in the face of adversity. This not only makes us weaker to deal with the problems we already have, but we develop more problems, making it harder for us to evolve. Technology has fortified our level of anxiety and made us more emotional about the trivialities of life. Stoicism dealt with this in a simple way that allowed life to be simple, light and more peaceful. To deal with these problems, I've left a link in the first comment to help you get rid of them, just as the Stoics did. Seventh Stoic Lesson Choose companies that will make you evolve. Seneca emphasized the importance of choosing our companies carefully because the people around us influence our character. Jim Rohn's most repeated phrase is that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. James Heron advises young writers and entrepreneurs to find a group of peers in their circle who will encourage them to improve. However, W. Clement Stone's maxim is even more expressive. Tell me who you hang out with and I'll tell you who you are. Seneca said that we should be extremely careful when choosing who we allow into our lives. He warned that no one fails to leave their mark on us, consciously or not. We must carefully consider who we allow into our lives. We can't afford to fear ending relationships with old environments or relationships when it's clear that they no longer serve us. Nor can we hesitate to approach new people or seek out new social circles that will enrich us. There is a lot at stake, as Seneca said. Just as some diseases spread, the mind becomes infected with the evils of those closest to us. So ask yourself, who am I spending the most time with? Who do I talk to on social media? Who do I see after work? Who are my closest friends? This lesson can be a little difficult, as you may have to make some tough decisions along the way. But remember, this is for your own good. Eighth Stoic Lesson You Will Die According to Seneca, our common mistake is to think that what awaits us is death. Most of death has already occurred. All the time that has passed belongs to death. Like many philosophers, death was a recurring theme in Seneca's writings. He advised us to prepare our minds as if we were coming to the end of our lives. We shouldn't put anything off and every day, we should evaluate the chapter we are writing in the story of our lives. Those who dedicate themselves to finishing their lives each day will not feel pressured by time. Seneca's greatest contribution on the subject of the final act of life is that in reality, this final act is not unique. Seneca realized that, in fact, we die every day. The time you've spent watching this video is worth a small death, just a few minutes. But no day, no minute, no second that has passed can be recovered. It's not that we have little time to live, Seneca insisted. It's that we waste too much of it. So we should do just one thing, live immediately. Go out and live now while you can. 
Luck is always there. Don't wait. Grab it now and live while you can. This may seem a little threatening and even frightening, but see it as an invitation of freedom to live the life you've always wanted, without judgment. After all, we only have this one life. Ninth Stoic Lesson Live Your Life at Dawn When it's hard to get out of bed, Marcus Aurelius would say to himself, I have to work. How can I be better than I am? What's there to complain about? If I'm going to do what I was born to do, what I was brought into this world to do, or was I created to curl up under the covers and keep warm? One of the most remarkable moments in meditations is this internal conversation that Marcus Aurelius had with himself at the beginning of the book. Evidently, this was a conversation he repeated often, many mornings. Like many of us, he knew he had to get out of bed, but he longed to stay under the warm, comfortable sheets. He understood the importance of conquering tomorrow in order to win the day and succeed in life. He knew that being the most powerful man in the world didn't exempt him from living according to nature. He understood that his social status was irrelevant and that his obligations to himself were waiting for him to wake up. He knew that staying in bed meant that he had to regain control and that he was reacting. If you want to be productive, accomplish more and achieve greatness, you need to wake up early. According to Marcus Aurelius, the start of a morning well done is half the journey. Tenth Stoic Lesson the obstacle is the way. According to Marcus Aurelius, our actions may encounter obstacles, but there can be no obstacle to our intentions or dispositions because we can adapt. The mind adapts and converts itself to its own purposes, just as happens in human and animal evolution. The obstacle is our action, the impediment to action. What stands in our way becomes the way. One way of facing life is to turn away from difficulties, to turn a blind eye to the unpleasant, to opt for the easy path avoiding difficulties whenever possible. The other way is the stoic way. We can choose, we can train ourselves, we can see difficulties as an opportunity, as grist for the mill, as a chance to learn about endurance, patience, resilience and struggle. We can see them as an opportunity to demonstrate our value, as a way of learning about people, situations, actions or things. Marcus Aurelius believed in the latter approach. He wrote about how fire turns everything that is thrown into it into flames. He said that it's better to see obstacles as fuel for the fire. It's not about accepting or resigning oneself to difficulties. It's about accepting them, deciding to take advantage of them, seeing them as an opportunity rather than an obstacle. In this way, we can turn what happens to us into fuel. Everything that happens to us can make us better and brighter. We can turn the obstacle into a path. This transformation not only makes us stronger in this obstacle, but in all the others in life. Life won't get easier, but you can get stronger. Eleventh Stoic Lesson The Stoic Virtues At some point in his life, Marcus Aurelius wrote, If you find something better than justice, honesty, self-control and courage, embrace it unreservedly. It must be something extraordinary. While Marcus Aurelius was writing the meditations, Rome was invaded and unleashed a war that lasted five years. The River Tiber suffered one of the worst floods in history destroying homes and livestock, which caused famine in Rome. After winning the war, the soldiers returning home brought back a deadly disease known as the Antonine Plague. Ravaged by famine and plague, numerous hostile tribes from the north took the opportunity to unite and attack the Romans. During the rest of his reign, he faced the evils of plague and war at the same time. However, Marcus Aurelius does not mention any of these terrible events in his diary. Instead, he mentions that no challenge or problem was so great that it prevented him from responding with the four Stoic virtues, courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom. In other words, not being afraid, not giving in to our baser instincts, not putting ourselves above others and not getting lost in the details, but seeing the bigger picture. He said that everything he faced was an opportunity to respond with these four virtues, which made even the most complex situations simple and clear. The only thing that mattered, he said, was doing the right thing. The rest doesn't matter. Remember this principle, wrote Marcus Aurelius. When something threatens to cause you pain, the thing itself is not a misfortune. To endure it and prevail is great good fortune. The things we didn't want to happen didn't happen to everyone, including Marcus Aurelius. A business failure, the loss of a loved one, someone we care about leaving us. Our instinct leads us to label these events as unfortunate because they are not what we wanted for ourselves. 
That makes sense. It's fortunate when we get what we want, and it's unfortunate when for whatever reason we don't. It's not true. It doesn't. Marcus Aurelius proposes a different way of looking at things. Instead of telling ourselves that we're unlucky because our expectations have been dashed, he says we should do the opposite. It's fortunate that this happened and that I came out unscathed, not destroyed by the present, nor frightened by the future. It could have happened to anyone, but not everyone would have come out unscathed. For a Stoic, we only suffer harm when our character is affected. We are harmed when we abandon what we believe in, or when we let go of our own standards. It may not be desirable to lose money, a friend, fail at something, or be criticized, but how does that make us unfortunate? Our ability to respond has not been taken away. Our character remains intact. There is no rule that says you have to go crazy over it, be heartbroken over it, or that you have to be anxious about the future. You still retain control, it's still you, and that's very fortunate. Remember that this may just be another obstacle placed in front of you, and you have the power to overcome it. Twelfth Stoic Lesson Be death conscious. As Marcus Aurelius said, you could lose your life right now. Let that determine what you do, say and think. Pierre Hadot called the meditations a collection of spiritual exercises, and there is no exercise that Marcus Aurelius does more than meditate on his mortality. Perhaps it was his own health problems that made him so aware of death. Perhaps it was the loss of his father at a young age. Perhaps it was the Antonine Plague that killed between 10 and 18 million people. Perhaps it was the awareness and power of the Memento Mori, the ancient practice of reflecting on mortality that goes back to Socrates who said that the true practice of philosophy consists of nothing other than dying and being dead. Most people label the memento mori that Marcus Aurelius practiced as morbid or gloomy. Most people want to avoid thinking about death. It's unpleasant, scary and sad. Why would anyone want to think about something they don't want to happen? It can all seem pointless. It's not about looking forward to the few days you have left. The purpose is the opposite. It's to liberate, to inspire, and it's the key to happiness which opens the door to empowerment, gratitude, charity. It's a full attitude every moment of every day. Memento Mori is the jolt that keeps us in the present moment. Marcus Aurelius liked to ask who on earth would think about their mortality if they only had a few minutes left on earth and say whether they should spend more time unhappy, scared or depressed. Our mortality isn't depressing, it's energizing. It reduces the volume of meaningless, silly and useless questions on which we waste so much energy because in the light of death, few things are worth getting angry about, stressing about, or worrying about. So keep reminding yourself, as Marcus Aurelius did, that you could leave life right now. Let that determine what you do, say, and think. He used this to do what had to be done, without letting the attempt of external influence affect him. Marcus Aurelius had this wisdom in mind after going through all his hardships and knowing what really matters. So in order to maintain a stoic life of virtue, he always woke up early to do what needed to be done. That's why he used 10 ways to wake up early every day. Click on the screen and watch it now.